today we're going to be talking about building characters. Now most of this will probably be stuff that you guys have already run into before, but I figure it's always good to talk about these things, especially because some of this stuff you may not know, some of this stuff you may know. This is just generally how every lesson is going to work. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is putting your characters in unfamiliar situations. So the importance of having a character that doesn't quite fit in your situation is because it will help in it'll help increase the likelihood that your characters um, will be more relatable to your readers. Um, everyone kind of doesn't naturally fit to feel like they fit all the time. You know, I mean, yes, you have your friends, yes, you have your family, but everyone has some place they feel like they just don't quite belong, right? And so having something that's unfamiliar to them will definitely help your readers. Um, great examples of this are like Hiccup. Technically, he's supposed to be the nef next chief of, chief of the tribe, right, for How to Train Your Dragon. And he's supposed to be this dragon fighter. He's the opposite of everything he needs to be. <laughs> he doesn't fit in that role, right? He has to rise up in order to fit that role. He has to make it his own. Um, and it's the same thing with anything else. Um, heck. Luke Skywalker is technically just a farmer, right? Like, yes, he has metachlorians and is originally born from Anakin and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, he wasn't raised as a Jedi like most Jedi are, right? He was raised as a farm boy <laughs> in a desert city. That is the furthest from Jedi you could probably ever get. <laughs> um, as a result, everything about the Jedi world is unfamiliar to him. Um, same thing with Harry Potter, raised by muggles. So even though he had a wizard in which um, parents, he was, wasn't raised by them, which makes it an unfamiliar territory to him. Um, this helps make it so that your characters are far more interesting because when they come across a problem, instead of just being like, ah, yes, I am a football jock and this is clearly the um, game that you have to do where, I don't know, you, it's some sort of game that is football related and it's like, well, I know how to defeat this magical trial because it's football related. No, <laughs> that's not interesting, right? It's just kind of like, oh, he knows football, he knows how to do it. Yay. <laughs> what would make it more interesting is if they are a complete nerd who's like, so you need to strategically do this and this and that, and the person's like, just play football. And he's like, but why? <laughs> you know, he doesn't fit in that stereotypical environment. Um, it also helps give a driving conflict for your story because, yes, the driving conflict, if it's a fantasy novel or a murder mystery, is generally, you know, find the killer or evil villain and destroy them, right? That's a good conflict, but it's important to have moral and emotional conflicts, too. If you don't have moral and emotional conflicts, then you're going to find yourself in a tricky situation because your characters are going to feel flat. You need to know what their morals and emotional um, situations are in order to really have them resonate with your readers. Um, and that only comes from being unfamiliar in a situation and having to adapt and give a new conflict to the story. Sometimes if you're doing a realistic fiction this can um, that is not like a murder mystery, um, it can give even further conflict to your story if, for instance, um, they have a really hard time dealing with chaos and they're very much like an organized person and then someone's like, you have to organize this office and it's this big fat chaotic mess, right? That is going to cause a dilemma for the character and it's going to cause anxiety for them. And seeing them in this anxiety provoking situation is going to help us connect with them on a deeper level. It also helps give the story a good character arc because if they already start where they're needing to be, then they're just gonna stay there. They're gonna stagnate. But if they start down here completely unfamiliar and have to grow to be familiar in a situation, you can really see from start to finish how they changed and how they and how they grew with the story. Um, and it's particularly important with growing in the story and character arcs that the unfamiliar needs to be addressed because of the fact that inevitably if it's, in a good, if it's a good, interesting story, you're gonna come across something that's unfamiliar. You're gonna have a lot of the familiar, right? So for example, a boarding school, that's pretty normal in England, that's pretty familiar. But having a witch and wizard boarding school, that's completely unfamiliar for Harry Potter. And the same thing goes even with um, crime dramas and things like that, right? 
Um, you have the familiar where they're like, you know, doing their investigative job or work. And then of course you have the twist where it's like, turns out the murderer was the aunt or something. <laughs> and you're like, what? I totally thought it was the stepbrother or whatever. And that can help make it so that it's far more interesting because it's unfamiliar, because it, um, because you have to weave a story that makes sense, but at the same time, the readers don't necessarily like predict it. And the unfamiliar helps give that notion that there you're gonna run into struggles and problems and you're going to have to fight to get to that ultimate character arc instead of just, I achieved character arc, from step one. <laughs> from the beginning of the page, I was the perfect protagonist. <laughs> this is kind of where the Mary Sue, Marty Stu thing comes in, where they just, that is them. They are the perfect protagonist from step one. All right, the next most important thing with characters is choice. Now, don't force your characters into situations. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't necessarily mean that you can't do that. It can happen, but it needs to be you force them into the situation and you it's obvious they don't want to be there. You can't force them into the situation by saying they somehow chose it when it's obvious to the readers that they wouldn't choose that necessarily. So for example, if they are a princess who is perfectly content with their life and they love everything about it, they're not just going to randomly run off with some random guy that they met who says, oh yeah, by the way, you're part of a prophecy now. Come on, come off with me. You know, like, no, I like my life. Thank you. <laughs> like, I'm staying here. Um, so I understand if you force them to choose that by like having the wizard who thinks she's part of a prophecy kidnap her. Okay, that works. But make sure it is actually forced or actually chosen explain why she would do that. Is she bored with her life? Is she like, I really desperately need an adventure. I don't feel like, I don't know, I don't feel like I love this prince that my parents have chosen for me. He's kind of a jerk. And so I want to go run off. Now that would make sense if someone says, you're part of a prophecy and you're like, great, the prince they just engaged me to was a jerk. I'm out. <laughs> that makes their sense, their choice make sense. Instead of having this seemingly they're just there for the plot you need to make sure that your characters have a reason for being there and that they're not just there because you want them to be there um, they need to have a moral emotional attachment to it I, you can barely see that on the screen but that's okay <laughs> um, the next thing that I'm going to mention with choice is give your characters a reason for the direction they're going which kind of taps into the other one of not forcing them but you gotta make sure it's a good enough reason. It's not just, oh, well, I'm bored. Because boredom can work if she's truly bored, but you gotta explain why she's truly bored. Generally, people who are just bored don't go run off and, you know, become a pirate. That's kind of the opposite <laughs> of everything that they know, right? Generally, if you're bored, you're gonna run off and do something else that's a little bit more tame. Maybe you're gonna go, I don't know, ride a horse or something off into the sunset, you know? Something very mild if you're, you know, a princess going from w one end to the other. You gotta make sure that it flows and has a reason and a purpose. The next point is make sure that if they make this choice, they see that it is either going to improve their life or they, or even if they have no choice, that it somehow improves their life. Um, if if they are making the choice, make sure that when they make the choice, they see how it is going to improve their life. If you don't explain how it's going to improve their life and then they just make that decision, then your readers are going to be confused as to why they're like, oh, this is so great, I made a fabulous decision, you know, when they're starving out in the middle of the woods with the wizard going, why am I the chosen one? You know, that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. It's clearly not improving her life. She should just quit and go home, you know? <laughs> but, um... If you make it obvious how it's improving their life and how they're moving forward with it, I think that helps. Um, for example, if she feels like she's being given a sense of purpose or if she feels like she's um, finally where she's supposed to be or if, she, I don't know, she's gotten away from that particularly jerky prince that she was supposed to be married to, then those are all ways that it's improving her situation and therefore 
the character makes sense as they move forward. Um, the next thing is if you force it upon them, like I said in the beginning, it has to make sense. So the ways that you can do this are pretty simple, but at the same time, a lot of people don't even think of using them because they're like, oh, well, she, they have to choose it. And it's like, well, not necessarily. Um, there are lots of times where people are forced into a corner, right? Um, and I can't remember what the actual name of the show is, but there is a show where the whole point is that they get locked into a corner because she is from another country and she cannot continue to work and be the boss slash CEO of her company if she gets extradited, obviously. And the only options for her are to marry someone who is a citizen or to um, fix her paperwork. And currently, she has been trying to fix her paperwork and has been running into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. So, she comes up with a slightly easier, albeit she thought it would be easier, but it wasn't, um, <laughs> solution where she's like, fine, I will marry my assistant because my male assistant will do whatever I say, including if I tell him to fake marry me. And they're all kind of like, oh boy, this is, seems like a drastic choice. <laughs> but at the same time, she was kind of forced into a corner, right? She was going to lose everything if she didn't get married or fix her paperwork. And the paperwork wasn't happening. So she really only had one option in her mind. Um, so it's good to, if you're going to force them into making a choice, you got to make sure that they feel like they only have one option. They feel like they're blocked into a corner. And you got to make sure that's obvious to the reader. You can't have any loopholes. The reader will immediately sense a loophole and be like, excuse you, why? Why did you do that? But if you don't have any loopholes, the reader feels their pain and their panic and kind of goes, oh, yeah, I guess you don't really have a choice, do you? <laughs> or, like I mentioned before, if you're going to force them into a corner and it's a fantasy story, you can also have them kidnap them. <laughs> Or if it's a murder mystery or thriller and you really don't want them to kill the bad guy or figure something out in particular, you can always force them to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? So if it's like, oh, I have to be on this stakeout in order to figure out who the killer is, and then it's like, oh, shoot, I don't know, uh, my wife's having a baby or something, I have to go, and then leaves partner alone, and so the partner gets like injured or something and they never learn who the killer is. That's a good example of something where it's forcing the character away from the situation where they need to be in by their own choice, by a good choice, or a bad choice in the case of kidnapping, but by their own choice. However, it is still forced upon them. You're not making it easy for them. It's not obvious which one they are going to choose. All right. Next point. Alright, making your characters a whole person. Now this might seem obvious, but a lot of times people will have their characters have one personality trait or one purpose. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> and sure, well that's okay if your if your whole point of the book, for example, is that they are a cheerleader or something and they have to learn that they have kind of been a little bit bratty their whole life then sure, having that be their whole persona as cheerleader, that's okay. But at the same time, a whole person generally isn't their stereotype. They, that isn't their identity. Um, and especially with villains, this is important. You gotta make sure that their stereotype doesn't become their identity. They are still a whole person emotionally, and they have reasons behind what they're doing as a villain, right? You generally, I mean, unless you're literally like, the eye of Sauron or Satan, you generally, generally are trying to do the right thing or feel like you're trying to do the right thing, or if you know you're doing the wrong thing, you feel like you're doing it for the right reason, or you feel like this is the only way to cope with certain other things. In general, there are certain ways that people have become a villain. It's not overnight. You kind of slip into it. For example, um, if you become an infamous bank robber, you might have started robbing banks purely because you needed a little extra cash to pay for rent, you know? It might be an innocent seeming beginning that then ends up being a problem at the end, right? Um, as a result of this, you gotta make sure that you're talking about more than just the stereotype. You need to talk about their emotional state. You need to talk about their moral state. 
you need to talk about their family or lack thereof. You need to talk about their friendships or lack thereof. There are so many things, even more than this, but these are the key four, that go into a person being who they are. And you gotta make sure that they, they demonstrate, especially those complex emotions, because a lot of people will just say, you know, well, they are the sweet, naive girl. Therefore, they are always sweet and always naive. No. <laughs> Even the sweetest girl in the entire school who has always been an angel all her life could have a really bad day and go home and just throw a tantrum. Right? <laughs> You've seen it with little kids. <laughs> right? You've seen it with little kids. You've seen it with teenagers where you're, you're like, I know this person. They are the sweetest person ever. And then all of a sudden, they snap at you for no reason. And you're like, well, but you okay? Like, what's up? And then they explain, like, I don't know, I'm sorry, you know, my dog is really sick. Or, I don't know, I'm just feeling really stressed because of finals, you know? Generally, there's a reason. People have other emotions aside from their main emotion. Sure, a lot of people can be more one temperament than the other. There are some people who are naturally more angry, naturally more happy, naturally more sad. Um, please close the door behind you. Um, <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, but generally, you're not just one emotion or the other, right? You generally aren't stuck in one stereotype, like we were talking about earlier. Um, so just out of curiosity, what are some examples that you guys have found in books are good, um, good showings of them being a whole person emotionally? We didn't talk about the other ones, but emotionally a whole person, a whole character. Yes. Stick from Brother Ben Chronicles. I'm sorry, I need more than that. <laughs> so 90% of people will probably not have heard of that, or at least I haven't. So give me a little bit of more of an example. Um, I, I can't remember. <laughs> okay, uh, that's okay. <laughs> this book has, people can Google it. <laughs> yeah, this book has uh, pretty good, the so-called murderer's brother mm -hmm. is like really uh, emotionally driven to help this girl find out if his brother's innocent. Yeah, that's fair, especially because that would definitely, especially if you have a good relationship with your family, you would want to prove they're innocent, right? If you kind of hated your brother, you might be like, haha, they're in jail. But if you actually like them as a person and enjoy them as a person, you want to defend them. You want to make sure that they get their side heard, right? That is a great example of an emotional complexity. Um, because you want justice to be served, obviously, generally we all do, but at the same time, if you're certain they're innocent, you're going to fight for them, right? And even if you're not sure if they're innocent, if you are your family and you love them, you might be in denial for a very long time. Even if they did, they're innocent, prove me wrong. <laughs> Can you shut the door real quick? Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> all right, um, next we're going to talk about friends. That was loud. <laughs> that was really loud, but that's okay, that's not your fault, that door's just loud. Um, <laughs> so, with friendships, this will help make them a whole person. Yes, sometimes people can be lonely or a loner, but the reason that this tr the trope of whole lone wolf thing generally doesn't go so well is because of the fact that you don't have any relationships to back that up on. You don't have anything to help them build on. Generally, even lone wolves have at least one good friend even if they won't admit it. They might be angsty and be like, mm, they're not really my friend, but deep down they're like, thank you for being my friend. <laughs> they're, not, they're not my friend, they're an acquaintance. <laughs> exactly, they might be like, they're an acquaintance, but at the same time, even lone wolves have friends. Generally, we as people, unfortunately for all you who are introverts and don't like humans, we generally are built to be an interactive species. <laughs> As a result, we, we like being with other humans, we like being around other humans, we like having friendships with other humans, even if we naturally also sometimes, introverts, can like being alone, and that's okay. But you can also want to hang out with people too. Just because you're introverted doesn't mean you want to be alone forever. Um, and even then, that also shows if they don't have friends, how do they handle their loneliness? Some people are absolutely devastated by being lonely and can't handle it. Other people would prefer to be alone. Yeah, <laughs> so, 
<laughs> in in general, with yeah. it, they cope better with yeah. being alone, and that's okay. Um, everyone handles loneliness differently, and then some people adapt to loneliness. Some people really struggle at the beginning, and then they slowly adapt. I know, as a kid, I had friends for sure, but in a lot of classes, I would immediately start over, you know, not knowing anyone. And as a result, I kind of learned how to cope with the between times, because obviously I saw my friends at recess, but whenever I didn't see my friends in between those times, I would write. Honestly, writing was kind of a coping mechanism because I was able to be less lonely because I had these characters in my head, and then if people came up and asked me, then I could also be like, oh, hey, here's a point of connection, read my stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know you want. <laughs> so that's why it's like, it helped me connect with other people in a passive way as well as helping me to cope with not being around people. So making your characters a whole person means that they have to have real emotions and they have to be complex emotions. They can't just be, I'm sad. It's kind of, it's kind of like a Hermione says, right? It's just because you have the emotional range of a teaspoon, right? <laughs> There's a reason that line resonates with people and it's because oftentimes book characters tend to have the emotional range of a teaspoon, right? You want them to be a little bit more varied in their emotional responses. Um, for example, like that scene, they were talking about the fact that Cho Chang was like, I think I might have a crush on and like Harry, right? But at the same time, she was crying. And he's like, why was she crying? And totally confused. And Hermione's like, well, she's sad, obviously, because the guy she originally liked died. So the likelihood that you might die is also possible. And she's just having to cope with the fact that, yeah, I'm moving on, but that also sucks because my previous boyfriend is dead, <laughs> right? So, uh, sorry if any of you haven't seen the Goblet of Fire right now, sorry. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so yes. as a result, the, the emotional complexity is important to make characters a whole person. Um, and so is the friends. Having friends or lack thereof, and if there is a lack thereof, explain how they deal with their loneliness. And yes, if they're a side character, it's hard to do that. But it's still, you can watch someone, right? You all have probably watched people. We're writers. We watch people to see their interactions. That way we can know better how to write yeah. them later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not stalkers. We just enjoy better understanding oh, other humans. <laughs> so as a result, you might watch a person being alone, right? And notice that everyone handles being alone differently. And even if you're watching them, you can see how they interact when people come close to them. Do they kind of shy away or are they comfortable with their own presence? Or do they kind of hide in the corner and wear all black and cover themselves up? Or do they just kind of sit in the corner like, I dare you to talk to me. That gives kind of a, a different vibe to being lonely, right? One gives like, help, I'm sad vibes, and the other one is like, I will bite you vibes. <laughs> and that's going to make your character more of a whole person, irregardless of whether they're a side character or a main character. Now the next point is family. And you don't have to talk a lot about family. Family isn't a main thing in your book, but this can be important, right? If you um, are raised by a single mother or a single father, or if you have both parents, or if you have <laughs> or a pack of hyenas, yeah, that's going to drastically change how you act, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> All of those situations are going to change how you act as a person and how you interact with other people. Um, and especially those interactions with your family. Make sure that they are also emotionally complex. We don't always love our siblings or always hate our siblings, right? Right, in general. I mean, I unless they're absolutely a horrible person. But <laughs> unless they're absolutely a horrible person or absolutely a complete angel. But in general, we have moments where we might be annoyed by a sibling we used to like. Or, heck, we might not like a sibling when we're younger and then grow super tight with them later. I know a couple of my friends have mentioned that their um, older sibling and them were super aggressive towards each other when they were younger. And then when they grew up, it was like they're inseparable. They are the best of friends. So honestly, relationships can change. Relationships can be complex. Relationships can morph within families. Um, it can also change depending upon your situation, right? Are you a foster kid? Are you adopted? Are you a step kid? Are you um, biologically their kid, but you don't necessarily feel like you belong anyway? You yeah, know, 
<laughs> so there are all sorts of ways that you can feel about your family that will show that. And with that, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. You don't want have to, but it's important to at least keep that in mind even in your own head. So for example, if I was like, hey, uh, this character has a single mother for a parent, they might never mention that in the entire story because it's not relevant. But they mention, but you know it in your head, and so you know, okay, in this particular emotional reaction, they're going to react differently because it reminds them of their mom. And you don't have to say it reminds them of their mom, but having that reaction and even you just knowing it will help give a different depth to the character because you're aware of that baggage or aware of how that works. Um, next thing is morality. Now this might seem weird, but every character has morals. And I, of course, like to use the Dungeons and Dragons method for me, but not everyone <laughs> likes Dungeons and Dragons, so that's okay too. But with morality, it is important, especially because there are all sorts of different flavors of morality, right? There's not just good, there's not just bad, there's not just neutral. That's why I like D&D so much. <laughs> it's because there's so many different things. <laughs> yeah, if you have lawful good, then that's going to make this character drastically different than if they're chaotic neutral. <laughs> that is me. Or y'all in neutral. It's like, I will set <laughs> fires and let y'all deal with it. <laughs> but yeah, in general, it, it helps us feel like we can connect to the character more. Or maybe it helps us feel like the character is a little more complex even if we don't understand it. Like with villains, generally, I will, generally, unless they're like the Joker or a serial killer, they will not fall under the category of evil actually they'll fall under the category of neutral why because they believe they're doing something good but it is for their own means right but they they know what they're doing is bad but they believe they're doing it for the right reason that makes them neutral like not a, evil like a, a hero you have to sacrifice this girl to save the world but the villain would be like oh i would sacrifice the world to save you exactly exactly i love that i've seen that several times on instagram and i love that so it's, it's important to realize what, what your villain or your person or, in general, character's motives are. And morality has a lot to do with your motives. Even if, you, even if you're not quite sure what your own morality is, it's important to explore that. I would rec highly recommend looking up um, Dungeons & Dragons, um, oh, what do you call that? A line Alignments. Alignment. There you go. I was like, it's an owl. <laughs> alignments. Look up Dungeons and Dragons alignments and then say compared to characters. And that'll really help you understand the alignments better. So you can also understand maybe where your morality comes from better. For example, I believe uh, the last chart that I looked at, Chaotic Neutral, was Captain Jack Sparrow. Yeah. <laughs> Which is an interesting way of looking at it, right? You look at it and you're like, huh. But then it slowly makes more and more sense, right? Um, and I think the... The other one that I saw the other day was chaotic evil was the Joker, which makes sense because he's he knows he's not doing the right thing, but he's doing it to have fun, hence the chaos. <laughs> so as a result of that, he is truly evil, and some villains will be truly evil, but don't count on it. They may or may not have their own reasons behind whatever the heck they are doing. All right. Well, moving right along. Green Lantern? Okay. Um, Alright. So, with, with making your characters a whole person. Ah, yes, there you go. <laughs> See, if you Google it, it'll just pop right up. It's super easy to find. Um, Alright, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is faults and strengths. So, Make sure that you don't make them, um, and this kind of ties in with that, it's a separate bullet point in my thing, but technically they tie together. Don't make them just their faults or just their strengths. That can't be their whole personality. <laughs> but this is honestly one of the problems that ha arose with Captain Marvel. She, her, um, because of the fact that she had amnesia and wasn't even really trying to figure out who she was, she never had this like moral or emotional crisis where we could relate to her. Instead, 
she was just, I am my powers, yes. And it was like, okay, good for you. But yeah, it definitely gives a Mary Sue vibe because she, her personality is her powers. And by the time you figure out like who she is and the fact that she, you know, supposedly pulled herself up by her bootstraps and everything and fought her way onto the Air Force, that's awesome. But I wish I would have known that in the beginning, even if it was just in a tiny flashback, you know, even, that she's like, I wonder what that flashback was for. You know, like it would help us to relate to her better. However, you also don't want to go on the other end of the spectrum. Having them be an entire and utter complete failure is painful. That's me. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I know that that can happen. And I know that that can be relatable, but you have to be careful with it. For example, um, Charlie Brown. He kind of is that character, right? Where everything goes wrong with Fran all the time. And it kind of sucks. <laughs> But at the same time, the reason that Charlie Brown is so relatable is because he also has a few good moments too. He, he balances them out instead of just being like, everything sucks all the time. Um, <laughs> yes, things are gonna suck. Yes, things are going to, you're gonna have your strengths, you're gonna have your weaknesses. Yes, things are gonna suck. Yes, things are gonna be great. But ultimately there's gotta be something that's balancing the scales. Even, and I'm gonna say this with a caveat. If you have a permanent string of failures, you've got to link it to like some sort of curse. That is okay. If you're going to link it to a curse and say like, That's they are failing small. and destined to fail forever because this random raven, like, I don't know, spat on their grave, then sure, <laughs> you can do that. But you got to make sure that it, it, it makes sense. You can't just have them fail for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to explain that for those who don't know? Uh, Murphy's Law is linked to this family uh, named the Murphys, mm -hmm. and um, it only happens to the boys, mm -hmm. not the girls in the family, and every time something really chaotic is going to happen when they're around, mm -hmm. so it's really funny, like the entire show is based around it. Absolutely. I, I love the fact that you brought that up. I just know a lot of people might not know that, and because of the fact that you were so excited about it, I figured you might be able to explain it a little better, and so thank you. Will go wrong. <laughs> exactly, and if everything that can go wrong will go wrong, nothing wrong with that. But you gotta have a few upsides along the way, right? Well, because to be fair, fair, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Sometimes that does happen. Sometimes there are just days where you're like, great, my boots have a hole in them, so I wore different shoes. Those different shoes then got wet because it snowed. Then after it snowed, I couldn't change my shoes because I had to walk to work after that. You know, like, <laughs> Sometimes everything that can go wrong will go wrong, absolutely. But at the same time, it's important to have at least a teeny tiny reprieve, even if they're like two seconds where it's like, I saw a butterfly. <laughs> I don't know. Just something to help it feel a little bit lighter. I just saw my, just like I just saw my grandma die. <laughs> Concern? That's, not, that's, that's it. it. Unless that's you're concerned. a villain psycho killer. Um, anyway. That's actually my thing. But no, you're not. <laughs> Faults you all. Meanwhile. Oh, yeah, you're not. <laughs> so, meanwhile, the <laughs> sit down, please. <laughs> so, with faults yeah. and strengths, you got to make sure that your characters are well balanced. In general, I would say try to lean on having more faults than more strengths, purely because of the fact that it makes them more relatable. But again, there's, there's balance there. The next part is obviously the last one that we always talk about, but showing their personality instead of telling it to us. Instead of telling us, um, Susie is a very happy girl and she loves Easter eggs. That's kind of boring. <laughs> However, if you see the look of glee on her face as she's running to try and find Easter eggs and she trips and falls, but she's still smiling because she freaking loves Easter. That is going to help show us so just cute. how happy she is, right? And so cute. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh, you're so wholesome. Um, just like with villains, it's going to show differently if you show their emotions. Um, if you just tell us they are evil because of the fact that their father, I don't know, beat them up a lot and their mother was a terrible toxic person and so they finally got out of their family and decided humanity sucks, I will kill them all. That, that's not that interesting, right? I mean, you're kind of just like, okay, I mean, that sucks. <laughs> However, if you, if you show the villain as a five-year-old being told he's not good enough by his mother and then slapped across the face by his father, that's going to tear your heart out, right? Yeah. And you're going to sit there going, 
I'm dying inside. I kind of understand why you want to murder humanity now. Like, don't, like, but I oh, get yes, it. <laughs> you know, like, it's, being able to see that is what helps give us that emotional connection to that character, regardless of role, whether they're main character or side character or villain. Um, especially when it comes to the complex emotions and when it comes to conversation. A great way of showing emotions is conversations. And sure, there are some conversations that you can skip over. Like if it's been three days and you've been having the same fight as a pair of friends or something in your story, and they're just fighting over the same thing every day for a week, you probably don't need to do that like, hey, every day. Hey, oh, write right oh, down the same fight. Oh, yeah. Unless it's, like, unless it's crucial to the plot line. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's not crucial if it's just redundant. However, what's going to be crucial to the plot line is showing the first fight and the last fight, and maybe the middle fight. But if it happens for a week every day, and it's the same dang yeah. fight, it's going to get a little boring, because it's redundant, because it's the same thing. So I agree. Crucial to the plot is absolutely important. That's why you have to have those fights. And you have to have the dialogue there. You cannot just say, we fought. That sucks. Yeah, Bad writing. <laughs> you fought about Elaborate what? You fought for how fight. long? I like <laughs> fights. <laughs> And even if it's not a physical fight, even if it's just an emotional fight, like, how dare you? <laughs> you know, that, that can like, be intense and fun to listen to too, right? Like, you're, you're in my room, get out. I'm not in your room. I'm yes! <laughs> exactly. You're touching me, you're not touching you. <laughs> yep, see, that was so interesting. If they just said, they fought, you'd be bored. But that is so much more interesting and it gives us a emotionally compelling thing to follow. However, Keep in mind, you don't have to show everything if it goes on for a long time. Because sometimes that happens with romance authors in particular, where they're like, they had the same fight every night for the last 10 weeks. That's fine if you want to say that, but don't give us 10 weeks of them having the same fight. We're just going to be like, please make yeah, up already. Yeah, I was like, 100 pages. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. 100 pages. Sell this like men. Over and over. It's like, why? Please stop. <laughs> That's what I'm just like, and I'm done. <laughs> yep. So in general, I would say make sure you show more than you tell, but if there's anything that's redundant or not plot necessary, then it's okay to tell. Um, however, with not being plot necessary, you also gotta keep in mind what kind of book you're writing. If you're doing fantasy and they go into the store and they're picking out what pet they want, probably not important, right? <laughs> but at the same time, unless it's like a magical pet, see there you go. <laughs> There you go. Like, this is why it's like, is it plot true. relevant? If it is their magical companion that they will have for the rest of their life, it's important. But if it's just a random pet that is going to show up maybe twice, maybe what? don't show that. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, uh, so what is the plot relevant? your life those two times. Right, then it's like, that seems important. But as far as, um, as far as this kind of stuff goes, you need to keep in mind if it is a realistic fiction. Because if, it, if it's any flavor of realistic fiction, mystery, romance, etc., it is generally going to be important to show even those little things. Not everything, but even the little things at the beginning. Um, once you get into the middle of the story and toward the end, it starts to feel redundant. But in the beginning, you don't know who these people are as a reader, right? And so it helps you to be able to connect to them better if you can see them in all places. Are they different when they're, you know, with the gas station attendant? Do they flirt with her? They're like, hey, you're kind of cute. You know, like, or is it totally like, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me. Like, that's yeah. going to give you a very different like, vibe. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's going to give you a very different vibe and tell you a lot about the character. And if you're being introduced to characters in a way that is realistic fiction, it's important to have those little interactions and discuss those little things because of the fact that it is going to help identify them in the beginning. Like I said, later, not so much, but in the beginning, it is gonna help them to become a full person in our minds. All right, now, this one actually ended a little earlier than I thought it was going to. So, do you guys have any questions before I wrap things up on character building? I'm happy to go more in depth on character building and just continue my rant if you want, but if you have specific questions, I'd also love to hear it. Um, when you want to describe a character, how in depth should you go? 
like Ooh. via looks. Via looks, so physicality, not yeah. emotional. Okay, yeah. that's good to specify, I was about to ask. Um, with physicality, I would say use the show, don't tell rule. And the reason I say the show, don't tell rule is because of the fact that generally you don't want to go too in depth when you're showing because it gets really, really long and wordy, right? Um, don't however, use a mirror, whatever you do. Do not use a mirror. I'm sorry, it's been done a million and five times. Oh, this is so like, tacky. Oh. There are so many better ways you could do I it. I have only seen one done super, super well. Yeah. And that was because of the fact that it was kind of a thriller and she described her own self like a zombie in the mirror as she's getting ready. And I thought that was kind of cool because yeah. I was like, you know, for a thriller, that's a great way to start, you know? Yeah. But like, what, what if like it has to be, yeah, it has to be original. Like their eyes have changed freaking colors and they're like, I'm staring at myself because my eyes are now orange. You know, oh, like, like, you know, like the, exactly. Like their hair is turning into fire. Or exactly, my hair or is like, on fire. Or that's like going to be a problem. Or like they get cursed or something. Yeah. And it's like, it right. envelops my arm and I can't believe what I'm seeing. Yes. I'm crying in the mirror. Yes, exactly. So if you if you have something drastic, then mirror scenes are fine. But it has to be something drastic. It can't just be like, I have blonde hair like I do every day. I have blue eyes like I do every day. Then why are you staring in the mirror unless you're a complete narcissist? <laughs> and yeah. if they are a narcissist, by all means, do the mirror scene and have them lovingly gaze in the mirror at themselves. <laughs> Nothing wrong well, with self-love, well, yeah. but there there is sometimes a little too much. <laughs> so... There's a difference between, yeah, I like myself, and hello there, handsome, <laughs> you know, talking yeah. to yourself. <laughs> That's a little different. There's a, there's a difference between, yeah, I'm happy with how I look, and holy crap, wow. I'm hot, and I <laughs> definitely damn myself. Exactly, I'm, I'm just dating. It's a difference with <laughs> yeah. narcissists, too, but it's yeah. kind of different. Yeah, I am yeah. neither of those. I do not have this. <laughs> yeah, no, neither do So I. as far as character description goes, to go back to that, I would say... Use the show don't tell rule because you'll notice, you'll notice the words more. You'll notice how in depth you're going because with showing, you have to use more words in order to describe. So if it's getting longer than I would say two sentences, you've probably gone too far, unless it's a romance novel, in which case one paragraph is your limit. At, <laughs> At the least. At the least, possibly two or three. three. Like, <laughs> exactly. Okay. If it's a romance novel, go wild. Okay. However, <laughs> if, if it is a fantasy novel or realistic fiction or generally anything else, I would say one to two sentences. And by one to two sentences, I mean like longer sentences. I don't mean shorter sentences. Um, but that's just generally my own opinion i would say do what you feel is necessary if there's like a birthmark that we absolutely have to know about go on to a third sentence but make sure whatever it is is relevant to the plot and helps give a good idea of the character if later you're going to be like oh yeah she's being hunted for her red hair and you never told us she had red hair that's going to be a problem <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's like Oh, just like red hair is the most magical hair, like in that world. <laughs> that would be problematic. Like, I mean, didn't know that they had red hair. I love that no one here has red hair. Yeah, or like <laughs> so. they don't describe it. They don't describe the character at all, and it's like he's grasping like black hair and like. Yes, and you're whatever. like you have black hair. I thought you had. I thought you had green hair. Wow. Exactly. Like I'm totally baffled. Yeah. This one we refer to in Writers Club as the Megan scenario. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Megan Steelheart. Megan Steelheart. Um, <laughs> doesn't say that she has blonde hair until, like, book two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is exactly. unfortunate. That is honestly... Because, like, honestly, like, it happens sometimes, sentence though. one mistake. And I gotta say, though, it's funny because with that, it just goes to show you, too, the fact that don't be too hard on your editors. Yes, they get paid a lot to do their job, but at the same time, even the professionals who get paid even more than freelancers because they're working for a company still sometimes screw up. Because they're human and they are people. <laughs> <laughs> and you as writers are going to mess up, and that's okay too. You need to be kind to yourselves. It's more important that you enjoy writing than it is that you beat yourself up for not I don't to be nice to myself. It's not fun. It, uh, being nice should be fun. <laughs> no, it's not. Do you guys have any other questions? <laughs> oh, four behind you. It's Eli. Oh, bet, you bet. It's not Eli. Oh, dang. It's not Hello. a regular. I need to sit at dark. Any other questions about building your characters? I'm here.
We're all good? Okay, I'm glad you addressed the detail question because sometimes that can be really tricky, figuring out how much or how little. Um, yeah, all right. If we're all doing good, then I will open things up for other questions and editing. Thank you guys for coming.